welcome and thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar on the handover protocols for the transfer of children associated with armed forces among groups, including those in detention. So my name is Sandra Menio, and I'm the co-coordinator of the Children Associated with Armed Forces and Armed Groups Task Force, also known as the CAFAC Task Force, under the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. So um, today we have uh, this webinar. Just wanted to double check that we have, yes, the slides are on. Okay, excellent. So um, as a global network of operational agencies, practitioners, policymakers, academic institutions, and donors, the Alliance facilitates interagency technical collaboration on child protection in all humanitarian contexts. So the operational guidance that we're presenting today is a collaboration between the Alliance CAFAC Task Force and watch list on children and armed conflict, which is a global network of international human rights and humanitarian organizations striving to protect children in situations of armed conflict. As we will hear in a few moments, handover protocols are agreements by governments or armed actors to swiftly transfer children allegedly associated with armed forces and armed groups who are in their custody or whom they have accounted to child protection actors for appropriate support services. So these services include, but are not limited to reintegration assistance. So handover protocols offer children a safe avenue to leave armed forces and armed groups and receive the care, protection, and reintegration support they need. So the operational guidance aims to support the signing and implementation of handover protocols by providing child protection actors with good practices, lessons learned, and other useful information on previous and ongoing negotiations and implementation processes in various countries. It seeks to support child protection actors to initiate and strategically navigate negotiations to promote the release of CAFAG in detention and improve standards for their prosecution. It also strengthens the implementation of handover agreements and the safeguarding of children at every stage of handover. So before introducing today's panel, I would like to take a moment to thank all colleagues behind the operational guidance and this webinar. I would like first to acknowledge Janine Morna, the lead researcher and author of the guidance, and the watchlist staff who coordinated and supported the research. I also would like to thank the CAFAC task force members, as well as the members of the watchlist advisory board for their support in the development and also in the review of the guidance. We would like also to thank Hani Mansourian, the co-coordinator of the Alliance and the members of the Alliance Steering Committee for reviewing the guidance. We also greatly appreciate the support of other members of the Alliance Secretariat, particularly Kira Loth and Shizuru Iwata, and Watchlist Victoria Walker for promoting and facilitating this webinar. We would like also to express a sincere gratitude to the Federal Republic of Germany, whose generous support made the development of the operational guidance possible. Lastly, I would like to thank the many child protection actors who participated in this research and share their experiences with negotiating and implementing handover agreements. So now without further delay, I would like to introduce our panel. We're very pleased to have with us uh, here today, Janine Mona, the author and researcher of the operational guidance. Janine is an independent researcher and lawyer focusing on international children's rights. She has extensive experience in humanitarian rights and human rights legal and field research, 
and advocacy work with organizations such as Watchlist, Human Rights Watch, and Amnesty International. She has been conducting research for Watchlist on the detention of children in armed conflict and the role of handover protocols in promoting the protection of their rights since 2020. We're also very excited to have with us today Solange Vass. She is the Chief Child Protection Advisor with the UN Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in Mali, also known as MINUSMA. Solange has firsthand experience in the implementation of Mali's handover protocol, which has led to the release of children from military custody to civilian reintegration programs. Following the presentation, this is Adrian Lapper, the director of Watchlist and Children in Armed Conflict, will moderate, moderate the question and answer section. So please use um, the Q&A function to ask your question instead of the chat so that we can more easily track your questions. So this is this icon um, in the bottom of your, of your screen, the little bubble saying Q&A. So and now I will hand over to Janine, who will tell us more about the handover protocol and share some of the good practices and lessons learned in the negotiation and implementation of these agreements. Janine, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. Uh, thank you to Watchlist and the Alliance for organizing this webinar and providing a forum to share some of the major recommendations from the guidance note. Um, and thank you to all the participants for joining us in what will hopefully be a very useful discussion. Uh, the guidance draws on 75 informant interviews with key stakeholders in humanitarian, UN and government sectors across 13 countries who have all graciously shared their expertise and experience working on these issues. To start this discussion, I ask you first to consider the thousands of children who have been coerced, pressured, abducted or lured to fight or participate in an armed group or force. And then upon their escape or release, instead of being allowed to return home where they can receive the support and reintegration services they deserve, they're instead detained by the government or an acting authority in an undisclosed facility for their alleged association with that group or force. Few of these children are ever formally prosecuted and often they're held in facilities unfit to meet their needs. Handover protocols, um, as mentioned by Sandra, are designed really to support children associated with armed forces and armed groups, or CAFAG, at every step of this cycle. They're in agreement either by the government um, or an armed group with or supported by the UN to transfer children from the custody of security actors, um, or whom they've encountered, to civilian child protection actors for support services, including, um, but not limited to reintegration assistance. Handover protocols systematize and standardize the process of transfer of CAFAG. So while the specific data on the number of children released through handover protocols is not readily available, anecdotal evidence suggests that in some cases, the rate of release is relatively high. Um, my colleague Solange, for example, can give you a sense of what the rates of release are in Mali. And even when the releases do not take place as routinely as stipulated in the handover protocols, child protection actors have relied heavily on these agreements in their advocacy. Um, handover protocols have been signed in eight countries. Uh, so you can see that on the next slide. Um, and those are the ones that are marked with the black dots. Uh, seven of them have been signed by governments uh, and one has been signed by the Ansar Allah, uh, formerly known as the Houthis in Yemen. Some countries I should point out like Myanmar and the Philippines um, have national legislation outlining the release of children from military custody. Um, handover protocols are also being pursued in at least three other countries. Uh, so before the coup in Burkina Faso, Mozambique, and also in Nigeria. Um, I think it's important to note that in addition to handover protocols, there are other documents that might call for the release or formal release of CAFAG to civilian authorities. Uh, they might be action plans, peace agreements, uh, ceasefire agreements, DDR frameworks, uh, hostage handovers, sometimes national legislation. Um, but handover protocols are typically pursued in situations uh, where they're considered less contentious to negotiate than other more sort of politically charged agreements. And when there's a process, process needed to quickly facilitate the orderly, orderly release of children. 
Um, historically, handover protocol negotiations have been initiated and led either by UNICEF and other child protection advisors in the UN peacekeeping missions. Um, and in some countries, the UN has also partnered with the ministry responsible for the protection of children, and the two have jointly led the discussions. The role of civil society throughout the negotiations is primarily supportive. Um, in at least one country, an NGO brought the UN's attention to the treatment of CAFAG and really mounted pressure on the UN to take forward uh, handover protocol negotiations with the government. Um, and in some cases, the UN has consulted with NGOs to develop a strategy uh, for negotiating with the government and has also included them in the review of the protocol and in the accompanying documents. NGOs um, also typically, typically play a very important role in implementing the protocol uh, by providing, providing support, interim care, and reintegration assistance. Uh, so through the research, we developed what we think are seven tips, basically, uh, for the implementation um, of, or for the successful negotiation of handover protocols. So our first recommendation is really to begin by conducting a situation analysis. You really need a strong understanding of the local context with detailed information on the recruitment, use and detention of children allegedly associated with armed groups um, and forces, as well as an understanding of the government or armed groups attitudes and perceptions to CAFAG. Um, it can also be really helpful in the beginning to map the availability of child protection actors and services that might be in a position uh, to provide reintegration assistance. The second recommendation is really to identify timely opportunities to negotiate the protocol. Timing, we found it really is everything, and it can happen at different points. Uh, so the first is perhaps when the situation in the country um, really escalates and there's a sudden rise in the level of recruitment and use of children, or an increase in the detention of children, um, then this might be a time where governments are particularly incentivized to act, um, especially if they don't have the means or expertise to support these children. Uh, so if, for example, in Niger, uh, when there was a mass detention of children from the Lake Chad Basin for their alleged affiliation with Boko Haram, this really created an ideal environment for negotiating the handover protocols. Uh, you could also choose to begin negotiations during a period of relative, relative calm where the stakes are much lower, and that can be a good time to engage. So, for example, in the Central African Republic, even though relative to other countries, the number of CAFAG that are detained is much lower, uh, the UN has chosen this time to begin negotiating a handover protocol um, almost as a kind of preventative measure. Uh, the third time that you might consider engaging in these discussions is when action plan negotiations or peace talks are taking place. So when an armed force or an armed group is listed in the Secretary General's annual report on children and armed conflict, that can open the door for the UN to engage with the listed party to develop an action plan to end the grave violations for which it might be listed. And during these negotiations, the UN could discuss the handover of, handover of children from within the ranks of the armed forces group and, and armed group, um, or um, uh, the handover of children that they may have detained. Uh, so for example, in Sudan and Chad, handover protocol agreements were uh, adopted as part of the broader um, uh, action plan arrangement. The third tip that we have is to really ensure the engagement of key stakeholders in the negotiations. You want to make sure you understand who the most influential actors are within the government and really include them early in the negotiation process. And then you want to find people within the government who are going to help you to champion the protocol. Although it's often very challenging to secure buy-in from armed forces and other state security actors, uh, they're among the most critical to the negotiation process. So for example, in Uganda, it was the human rights focal points within the military that were quite instrumental to the handover protocol negotiations. Our fourth tip is to identify allies to support the advocacy. Uh, support from those external actors often strengthens the handover protocol negotiations and can really reinforce some key messages. And there are many possible supporters, and I'm gonna list just a couple. So this can come obviously from humanitarian and child protection agency, gender-based violence response actors, the ICRC in some cases, uh, diplomatic missions. Uh, some of the support can also come from donors who are providing security sector support to the government. So negotiators should encourage those donors to condition their security assistance on the adoption and effective implementation of handover protocols. And this is sometimes all the more important because in some cases you have donor governments who have armed forces 
present in the country who are engaging in joint military operations with the national armed forces. Uh, so for example, when the French Barkan forces first intervened in Mali, um, in response to the kind of growing insurgency, uh, they found that they were often encountering children on the battlefield. So these governments need to be as invested as national governments in establishing a strong system to support actions that are going to be in the children's best interests. You can also call for support from countries that have already signed hand of the protocols. So um, during the initial stages of the negotiations in Burkina Faso, uh, a delegation from Burkina Faso met with authorities in Niger, who have already adopted a handover protocol, to learn a little bit more about their experiences. Um, and we were told that that was quite a persuasive um, engagement. Um, other entities that you can look for support from, um, other UN entities. So staff that have been uh, present in countries where handover protocols um, have been negotiated have been found to be a great asset. Um, and you can also call for support from the Special Representative on Children and Armed Conflict, who in many cases has helped to provide high level advocacy and support uh, to help advance negotiations. In some cases, the Security Council has also been an important uh, supporter of the adoption of handover protocols, either through calling for them through their resolutions or other outcome documents. And that I think has really helped to elevate uh, the profile of handover protocols in those uh, countries. Um, and really help to prioritize the negotiation of those agreements. Um, finally, local communities can also be encouraged uh, to raise question about the government's plan uh, to respond to children who might have been recruited from those areas. Um, our fifth tip is really to raise awareness of the government's legal obligations to CAFAC. So it's not always clear and obvious uh, to representatives um, what the appropriate treatment of children should be uh, or CAFAC should be. So prior to negotiations, it's really advisable to conduct an analysis of what the applicable domestic and international legal framework is going to be uh, on the treatment of CAFEG in the target country. And once the relevant stakeholders have been identified, uh, conducting training and awareness raising events on the relevant international law and standards um, are very critical for building a foundation of support for adopting the, uh, the handover protocols. In some cases uh, where uh, the national legislation might be weak, then it might be advisable to focus on the country's international legal obligations. The sixth recommendation we have is really to develop short-term and long-term protection and reintegration responses alongside with negotiating the handover protocol. So most governments are really gonna be reluctant to sign handover protocols without strong uh, programs to support the care protection and reintegration of CAFEG. And in particular, governments want to ensure that any child that release is released is not going to be a security threat to the local population or potentially at risk of re-recruitment by armed groups or at risk of facing retaliation from their local communities. So if negotiations are happening quite rapidly, rapidly uh, you could uh, consider to uh, develop short-term care responses uh, that can be put together quite quickly. And that ensures a minimum level of preparedness, especially for children who might have special needs. Uh, some of the initial steps that you might want to be taking during the handover protocol negotiations include mapping some of the pre-existing child protection systems that could be used to support any children that are released. During this time, preparation should also be made for long-term reintegration responses, uh, where children are transferred to civilian child protection actors, um, and they may spend a few months in residential or non-residential facilities uh, where they're provided with immediate care and protection and receive uh, the support they need to prepare them to go back to their families and their communities. The seventh and final tip that we have is really to consider the process that you're going to use to engage in the handover protocol negotiations. So managing the negotiation itself is sometimes as important as managing the political sensitivities surrounding handover protocols. So negotiators really want to consider how and when they are going to engage various stakeholders in the negotiations. So it could be bilateral, sort of one-on-one -on -one discussions with different ministries, or there could be a series of workshops where different stakeholders are engaged. In some countries, the government has set up a committee um, that is going to be the one leading the negotiations, or they'll have a lead representative who will engage with the UN and kind of oversee the implementation of the handover protocol. Whatever the format uh, that is best for the country that you're in, it's really important, we think, to maintain momentum for the discussions. So <clears throat> what does one do if you are engaging with a state entity that is holding children, or not engaging with a state entity rather that is holding children, but rather an armed group? 
Well, as I mentioned earlier, the UN has successfully negotiated a handover protocol with one armed group, uh, the Ansar Allah in Yemen. And prior to the coup in Sudan, the UN had also began to engage armed groups who were part of the Juba peace agreement uh, to commit to various activities, including the development of handover protocols for the transfer of CAFEC. So some of the traditional approaches that I mentioned before uh, may not really be relevant uh, to engaging with armed groups because many of them just lack the same resources and capacities as governments. Uh, the major recommendation from looking at the case study, I think, in Yemen um, and from other research is really that um, when the UN is engaging with an armed group, uh, for example, in action plan negotiations or peace talks, uh, negotiators should really consider in context where it's relevant, advocating for the adoption of handover protocols among the armed group's commitments. Um, so as I mentioned before, handover protocols can and have played a very important role in promoting the release of children in detention. So as I mentioned, in countries like Niger, the handover protocol was negotiated specifically to address a large number of children from the Lake Chad Basin um, who had been de detained for their alleged affiliation with Boko Haram. So if you look at all the handover protocols that exist currently, most of them are phrased quite broadly, and they call on the transfer of children separated from armed forces and armed groups. And in several countries, that has also included the transfer of some children in detention. It is important to state, however, uh, that these are not documents that are providing some sort of grant of immunity, uh, which has been a common objection uh, among governments. So as childcare practitioners, what do you really want to be saying about children in detention in your handover protocol? Uh, well, first, you want to say that all children in military or armed group custody, including those in detention, really need to be transferred to civilian custody. And that's no matter what. And the specific arrangements around uh, transferring children from detention can be outlined, not necessarily in the handover protocol agreement itself, but in an accompanying implementation plan. The second is if there is no agreement with the government that you are going to unconditionally release all the children that are encountered or in their, contest, in their custody, um, including those in detention, and if the government is really insisting on pursuing some cases against some children, then we really are encouraging practitioners to outline the standards for prosecution of children in the handover protocol. And that's not really something that's been done before. So what does that really need to include? Well, first of all, the, the, the fact is um, this should really only happen in exceptional cases. So the prosecutor has the discretion to, to decide who they're going to pursue prosecutions against. Um, and for example, the special court in Sierra Leone uh, determined that it was not going to prosecute any children for their involvement in the war. Uh, children should also only be prosecuted for very serious crimes, so war crimes or crimes of physical or sexual violence. That's the standard that we're recommending in the guidance note. Uh, children shouldn't be prosecuted solely for membership in armed groups or forces, and that includes groups designated as terrorist. Um, and they shouldn't be uh, uh, prosecuted for activities that would otherwise not be considered criminal. So cooking or cleaning or driving. It's also important to articulate that criminal responsibility is individual. So children shouldn't be detained, prosecuted or profiled based on their association of their parents or their relatives. So children who meet the criteria for prosecution should be transferred from military custody and sent to the authority responsible for juveniles within 24 hours um, who make the determination about the prosecution. So if we could just switch to the next slide because it outlines a little bit the standards so people can follow along. Thank you. <laughs> Um, a specialized juvenile justice system or civilian court with personnel um, who are trained on child friendly procedures and who are connected to the child welfare system really should have the primary jurisdiction over children investigated and or charged for crimes during their period of association, rather than the military intelligence, uh, national security or other similar special courts. In all cases, children deprived of their liberty have the right to prompt legal and other appropriate assistance and should only be held in facilities that support and prepare them for reintegration. Um, in accordance with international standards, children who are accused of crimes during their association should be treated primarily as victims and detention should only take place as a measure of last resort for the shortest period of time and in line with international juvenile justice standards. So what does that really mean? Well, as child, uh, child uh, protection practitioners, 
uh, you should be advocating for states to design diversion mechanisms for children that are charged with crimes during their period of association, which really allow children's cases to be resolved by non-judicial bodies. And this has happened in a variety of contexts. Uh, restorative justice mechanisms and local community-based programs, which both help to uh, uh, children appreciate the moral consequences of their acts, but also help to promote reconciliation are an, on, on, are an alternative to detention. So in some countries, this has included truth and reconciliation commissions, which have provided a forum for hearing children who have committed war crimes um, and include special safeguards for children who are testifying. It could also include traditional justice systems um, or reparations. Um, in all cases, reintegration programs should be available to children who have either been diverted from the judicial process um, or who have completed uh, custodial prison sentences. Um, in countries with weak or non-existent juvenile justice legislation, uh, child protection actors may have to engage in complementary advocacy to support the handover protocols and really to try and promote some of the legislative amendments that will help to strengthen the protection of children, including CAFAG during the prosecution. So what does this include? Well, first of all, you really want to strengthen the juvenile justice law, make sure that it is in line as best as possible with international standards. You want to strengthen protections for juvenile in, juveniles in the counterterrorism law as well. And that includes prohibiting the criminalization of association with armed groups for children under the age of 18. It should also end the detention of children based on family ties. <clears throat> and most importantly, counterterrorism uh, legislation should have an express provision that states uh, that all children under the age of 18 will be subject to the relevant juvenile justice laws. You want to raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility to at least 14, but ideally higher, higher per the recommendations of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. You want to make sure that recruitment and use is criminalized as a war crime, uh, and that makes sure that you shift the responsibility for the acts committed during the period of association uh, from children to the adults who went about recruiting them in the first place. Finally, you want to encourage the government to ensure that they adopt a comprehensive raw law on the rights of the child, and that includes provisions recognizing CAFAG as victims, and it criminalizes the recruitment and use of children. Um, finally, I'd like to encourage you to take a look at the guidance note um, and to review um, Annex 3, where we have provided a handover protocol template. Um, the guidance goes into a lot of detail about why some of the language was chosen um, and an explanation of each of the directives um, in, in the template. Um, I wanna draw your attention specifically to provisions for girls. Uh, to ensure that they are included in handovers um, and in reintegration programs. And I also want to point out a section on mechanisms to strengthen the implementation of handover protocols, which is not something I've had the time to review here, unfortunately, but are, are discussed in detail in the guidance notes um, and will be addressed a little bit in my colleague Solange's presentation. Uh, so with that, I now turn to my colleague uh, to discuss um, a little bit about the obstacles and successes um, of implementing the handover protocol in Mali. So a little bit of a case study, uh, but please, I really do welcome your questions. And of course, my contact information is available to you here, uh, should you wanna engage with me uh, directly one-on-one -on -one as well. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you so much and over to you, Solange. Thank you. Good morning, all. Can you hear me, Janine? I'm sorry, I'm having technical issues. I had to join from my phone. Yes, we hear you well, Solange. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm really sorry. I'll ask you for your indulgence first. I had to join from my phone due to technical problems with my computer. So, but I'll do my best and I hope you guys can, you know, be a bit um, indulgent. So, uh, first of all, good morning. My name is Solange Vass. I'm the Special Child Protection Advisor of the MINUSMA mission, UN mission in Mali and also heading the Child Protection Unit. And today we are going to be discussing very briefly what is basically our experience in implementing the uh, handover protocol in Mali. Without further ado, I think we can start already. Okay, well, the next slide. Okay, so just a little bit of background, first of all, on the protocol. As you can see here, the protocol basically was signed in July 2013 between the UN and the government of Mali. So basically it complemented an earlier interministerial circular 
that was basically signed by five ministers addressed to all authorities and leaders and basically addressing the main, um, let's say minimum procedures for handing over children found associated with armed forces and armed groups. And at the time I must say that it was very much um, needed because we had scores of uh, children that were recruited and used by armed groups, even though at that moment, we could not really make up um, for exact numbers. Here you can see one extract of the then report of the Secretary General, when he was basically making mention of 24 children that were held in detention facilities by government. Just to mention that a few dozen others were also held here and there by respective armed group that has seized them during uh, military operations. So that was the, the momentum basically that the protocol was signed and um, because we had basically many issues to contend with and we were lucky to start with because we had always very good, uh, let's say will and acceptance from the government. And that also in itself is very important if you are to ensure the success of implementation of any protocol, of course. Um, next, Kyra. Basically, what we consider to have worked well, in other words, that we can call also our achievements and just what we think, you know, was the best practices. The first one, as you can see from the slide, we have had an extremely high release of children from detention since the protocol was signed up to the end of last year. So up to 99 children, percent of children that were arrested and detained were all released. And the good thing is, even those that were charged before the protocol, I mean, some few children that were charged 2012, 2013, before the protocol was signed in July, also eventually got to benefit from the protocol and be released, which is a very good thing. So now we have only about 1% children that are remaining in detention. And it is worthy to mention that their minority um, age is factored and they are now staying there just because of dispute on their age. In other words, government is um, considering them to be of adult age, but we have the assurance that as soon as they have the proof that indeed these are children, they will be released, which is a very good thing. And of course, we don't have any child arrested that is below 13, which is, I think, a very good thing considering the particular case in Mali and also the sub-region. Uh, the other um, successful story that we have is that um, even, um, <laughs> it's still back on the slide, <laughs> sorry, is even though the protocol is signed only by the UN and the government, it's a bound, you know, um, it's binding to everyone. So all the forces that uh, basically perform arrest and detention and handover are following the rules. And it's a very good um, thing for us, uh, not to name but a few, Borkan, the MINUSMA mission, all of them have their own SOPs on arrest, detention, and handing over of individual, including children, but they are do their best to basically work with us on the protocol. For, for example, MINUSMA, even the SOPs on detention specifically mention the protocol and the need to hand over the children to the child protection section. Thank you. Now we can move on to the next. I'm very sorry about that. And the third one we are having is basically um, coordination. We found that um, given that the protocol clearly specifies who is receiving the children has really helped us a lot in avoiding, you know, disorganization and chaos that usually arise when children are arrested and people, the, I mean, practitioners try to find out who to hand them over to and how to do it. So since the protocol is very clear on that, that has helped us a lot. And of course we have um, specific provisions according additional protection to children, to name but a few. Um, basically, foreign national children have very specific provisions for their repatriation, also limitations to the nature of interviews to be conducted, nothing that is harmful to the children, nothing that puts them in danger, prohibition of military um, um, interrogations, and of course, um, protection of children from the media, what some of you may not know is that in the early days that the protocol was being implemented, a lot of children were being basically, um, you know, exposed through the media, through the news, to show that the protocol was being respected. A government wanted to show their goodwill and the fact that they were respecting, you know, international law, 
But when we pointed out that was a violation of the right of children to privacy and of their right to general, they had to be shielded from the media. They quickly agreed with us and that uh, didn't happen again. But we had a lot of cases where children will be just being depicted and shown in the you know, uh, news and to show that the protocol was being basically implemented. And as we said, also confidentiality of information, everything that is gathered about the children are uh, shared with others on only a need to know basis. The fact that we have a set time allocated for the handover of children is also very important. And most of it, um, um, actors, stakeholders really try to stick to it. Of course, we have every now and then few cases where the children are detained beyond this uh, reasonable uh, period, but sometimes it's because either they have been injured and need to be in specific care or something very specific happened. So those are just one-to-one -one basis. And also cooperation with the international forces, as I was saying, that perform arrest and detention has proved to be very um, useful. We are having weekly meetings. We are having specific formal forums that are set up to discuss you know, what is happening. We are having specific training provided to the also forces, my and defense and security, not to name them. And they have each and everyone appointed focal points, which works very well. The next slide. Don't, um, okay, so um, I have some, can we go on with the next slide? Okay, so joint detention visits and interviews is something that has helped us a lot. We have had instances where we have visited with government focal points from the Ministry of Justice or even the Ministry in charge of Children's affair, Affairs. And we found that was very effective, not only in ensuring immediate release of children at times, but also in ensuring sometimes immediate follow-up to issues raised by the children, such as poor detention conditions or um, ill treatment allegations, et cetera. So we were able to follow up right away. And that also has been um, very, very um, well. And I think I have a last point that maybe was not covered here. Yeah, government system focal point system also, and in general um, machinery. So I'm still on the previous slide, you understand. That has also proven to be very well in terms of allowing us to uh, implement the protocol in a um, positive manner. Of first, when we had at times the focal point from the government, the position was vacant. So it was extremely difficult at times to even access some of the detention facilities. But we found that if and when there is a focal point dedicated to the, the implementation protocol from the side of the government, it's really very helpful. Now onto the obstacles. I think one of the biggest one really is the, the difficulties in determining the children's ages. This is really the, the I can say the major um, obstacles we have had so far for implementing the protocol. Because as you know, there are various birth registration issues in Mali. And really, when children don't have a civil documentation, uh, it can be problematic. So here, what we've tried to do is basically train all those that are um, working and implementing the protocol. So we found that by uh, discussing with them, raising their awareness on the provisions and just in general, reviewing the procedures, it's been very helpful. So what we've done so far is also work with government on trying to, deter to adopt alternative credible ways because so far many people are still relying on the, I don't want to call it old ways, let's say ways that were formerly used, such as um, um, going to a forensic um, you know, doctor to measure the length of the bones, uh, do x-rays, et cetera, trying to determine the age. And just to give you an example, we had a case where we determined the individual to be an adult when they conducted an interview by the um, um, other officials, they said it was he was 16. At the end of the day, the, the person was about 32 years of age. So it's just to tell you some of the problems we are having. And to the next slide, Kyra, please. The second one is basically lack of awareness, as I was mentioning. Every now and then, especially in the regions, you will come up on someone like a brigade commander who's um, being, you know, accepting children from the pharma because simply he doesn't know that the protocol is in existence. But those are quite um, easy cases because every now and then when we are aware that children are being handed over to them or about to be handed over, that's mostly the case. We are able to intervene quickly and um, throughout that course of action so that the children are instead 
hand it over to the regional directorate for protection of women and children that has worked also well. So what we found is, especially in the region, we must continue our awareness raising work through posters, through technical workshops, and basically, um, let's say, constant interaction with the partners that are there on the, on the ground, constantly training them. Um, I'm saying something about active engagement and advocacy with the prosecutor's office. As you must know, we talk about it a little bit later. Now we have this counterterrorism agenda in Mali and a special anti-terrorist poll. So we also have to particularly interact with that office in relation to children that are arrested for um, association with groups labeled as terrorists between court and courts. So on to the next slide, um, which is on the, I think, the protocol, yeah, handover protocol. We found that the fact that the all, you know, there is the G5, G5 Sahel operation in Mali covering basically five countries. And we found that the fact that we don't have either a common protocol, protocol common to all the countries or every country having its own protocol, it's still basically boring down to the same for us is a problem because for now the cross-border dimension of the conflict is not only putting children at risk, but many of them are found in Mali. They are foreign nationals that need to be repatriated. So the problem we are having is a ch child may find himself liable, not liable, handed over, let's say, to child protection actors in Mali and liable to prosecution if and when we return him to his country of origin. And that's something we have to deal with. So our next course of action is to advocate so we can have either a common protocol to all uh, G5 countries or try to harmonize the already existing protocols. The next slide, now onto the anti-terrorism uh, agenda. As I was saying, Mali, uh, most of you know of the particular situation in the country. So the legislation, the measures, the operations, all of that uh, regarding, you know, terror counting, ter counter, sorry, terrorism has, of course, affected affected our, our operation. As I was just mentioning, when we have a group of children that are arrested because they are, um, they are accused of basically colluding with terrorist groups, we have a really hard time getting those children out compared to other more maybe uh, accepted groups. I mean, this is just for lack of better words. And uh, what we have, I I'll give you an example of a group of 15 children we had um, um, last year in detention and all our negotiations with the special prosecutor, heureusement, as they say in French, uh, pointed out to the fact that if and when we produce identity documents, the children will be released. We are working on that. But just to tell you, it's been very difficult. I did I say last year, two years ago, I'm sorry, the 15 children have been there two years ago. We still managed to release some of them last year. I think about three of them are still there, but it's just to tell you the difficulties we are having compared to other, other children from other uh, groups. And uh, I think this was the last of my obstacles. Now, the, my last slide, basically on the impact of the protocol so far for us in Mali, actually, as I was mentioning before, I was talking about the importance to have acceptance and uh, goodwill from the government. That's a total yes. If you don't have that, you're not getting anywhere to start with. And then for us, it has been extremely instrumental securing a very high release of children from detention. As I said, up to 99% of them have been released, which is fantastic. Um, in the beginning, there was a, on my slide, but I didn't mention it. We have about 35% of all children that were, no, 35%, yeah, of all children that were uh, recruited and used. So 35% of those children were actually arrested, detained, and released. For, for us, it's a huge number because that means that we have a quite um, substantive number of children arrested. Um, sorry. We have quite a good number of children that are actually recruited and used that are finding themselves in prison. But if we're getting 99% of those released, then it's a good thing. But it's just to show you the amount of children that are actually being recruited and unfortunately end up in prison, which is definitely another type of violations of their rights, but I will not dwell onto that. Uh, greater protection of children affected by the conflict. I was talking about the special measures for foreign national children. I spoke also about how they were shielded from the media exposure 
and uh, confidentiality and interrogations to be conducted. So, and of course, special needs of girls, women, and not women, and children with special needs. So all of that is covered. And how, when, before they are handed over, they have to be separated, you know, gender, these are just a common, um, um, how do you call it? Common things you'll find in the protocols as to the minimum standards. That's why I did not really dwell on that. So for us, it also has an impact on the protection of children. I was talking about the clarity on the roles, procedures and responsibilities, starting with the actors at the regional level, where we have had, we the UN, I mean, with the support of UNICEF installed um, transit and orientation centers with the regional directorate, which is the government body to make sure that all the children would be taken care of. And then, um, yeah, the expanding counterterrorism agenda, we spoke about it, how this has been helping. And just that if we did not have this protocol and could not ensure these many children were going through the, the necessary reintegration system, what would we have? We already know that in Mali, we have about yesterday, I was counting 1,600 something clo uh, clo schools that are closed. So almost, I think, uh, half a million children are not able to go to school that are prone to recruitment and use of children and many other things. And probably they would end up on a very um, bad situation if we did not have the protocol and were not able to basically help them better protect their rights. Um, thank you very much. I think I will stop with that. And probably if we have questions or more interactions in the chat, we can continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Solange. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation, and I think it really illustrates um, how health handover protocols uh, can be used as a tool to promote the protection of children's rights in armed conflict, um, but also considering some of the limitations um, and challenges of implementing handover protocols. Um, I'd also like to thank Janine for your um, thorough presentation on the new operational guidance. Um, we've dropped the uh, link to the operational guidance um, in the chat um, for those interested in reading more. Um, and um, um, yeah, so we'll now move on to the Q&A. Um, for those who may have uh, missed the introduction, uh, I'll just uh, introduce myself briefly. I'm um, Adrian Lapar. I'm the director of Watchlist on Children in Armed Conflict. Um, and we'll um, take some questions from the audience. Um, just a reminder, you can use the Q&A function uh, for those. Um, but just before we do, I'd like to very quickly turn to Janine, um, as you know, is the, is the researcher and author of the operational guidance. Um, Janine, you've been uh, conducting research on the detention of children in armed conflict um, and the role of handover protocols in protecting their rights um, for nearly two years now. Um, and you've written two reports on this issue and now the operational guidance. Um, so what, uh, what is next? What comes next? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think the first thing we want to be able to do is to roll out the guidance as best as we can. And to that note, we really do um, encourage um, from all the participants here and some who might be listening to this um, recording uh, to please provide us with feedback. You know, this is a live document. We intend to, you know, <clears throat> continue to work on it, continue to update it, um, and we welcome your recommendations. Uh, particularly if you do end up using it in some of your negotiations and in the field, offering us that feedback uh, so that we can continue to uh, strengthen uh, the document for uh, future negotiations. Um, the second is I think we really want to translate the document into French and Arabic uh, to make sure it is well and fully accessible to those communities and um, there are plans for that uh, coming forward. Um, and then the third is, I think we want to continue to familiarize policymakers uh, with handover protocols um, and to advocate for their signing, to advocate for their better implementation. Um, so that includes in places where uh, countries are, are affected by armed conflict, um, but it also includes with uh, influential governments and governments that are providing uh, security sector assistance. So we have um, done some one-on-one -on -one bilateral advocacy with some of these governments um, to really try to encourage them to, to condition some of that security assistance on uh, the adoption of handover protocols. Uh, so I think those will probably be the immediate next steps following um, the release of the guidance note. Thank you. Um, so questions from our participants, um, I'm going to kind of together, um, we've had some questions regarding um, the uh, what, what happens with children once um, they've 
um, transferred to child protection actors. Um, so this is perhaps a Solange additional points to add about how, how to children released from detention centers uh, receive the support services that they need, um, whether uh, including reintegrations, um, support for survivors of sexual violence, um, psychosocial support, et cetera. Uh, and particularly, um, maybe for Janine, how to address, um, address that in um, country situations where there may not be uh, strong um, uh, national reintegration programs. So first, uh, maybe Solange, and then we'll turn to Janine. I'm sorry, I think um, I, Adrian, I think I missed the first part of the question, please. I'm sorry. Sure, just uh, how um, how do you ensure that children um, that are transferred from detention uh, to uh, child protection actors receive the support services um, that they need, uh, including reintegration, but also um, psychosocial support, uh, support for survivors of sexual violence, um, et cetera? Sure, I'm um, sorry, yeah. Um, where is this screen? No. Okay, um, yeah, how do we answer this? As um, many of you must know probably, is that um, we have a UNICEF, our counterpart from the MRM um, working group that basically takes, takes care of everything that is longer term um, processing children, which means reintegration, reascension and everything. So basically what they've done is making sure they work, they, they work sorry, with their partners that are in charge of the reintegration and support program to make sure that first of all, they are tailored to the children's needs. And also to mention that the children get to stay in the transit and orientation centers for a minimum length of, I think about three months. And they undergo quite a number of, um, let's say minimum, um, I cannot say classes, but minimum life, le life lessons that we think are important to them. And they also receive obviously psychosocial support because you know every now and then you may also have um, children, girls that are maybe victims of sexual violence and children that have just special needs. So we make sure that they are followed up not only on the psychosocial and medical side, but also in terms of reintegration, we make sure that every reintegration program we do is tailored to what they need. And we have a plan on embarking on a survey or review of the reintegration programs to make sure that when they are back in their back, um, when they when we yeah, are back in their family, family reunification, basically, it's going down well. So so far, from the little, um, let's say, feedback we have received from our partners all throughout the regions where children have been returned, they have been accepted back well, which is already a big challenge because in many other instances, um, different from Mali, children are rejected when they go back in the community or they are stigmatized or they're ostracized. So we don't have the back, that backlash in Mali. And we make sure that whenever the children go, they also carry with them reintegration packages and they are able to fit into the, the community. But as you may know, the programs, the UN programs are not only specifically tailored to the CAFAGs. Every now and then we also make sure that we um, include other children also maybe from the community or who have similar problems who are affected by the conflict otherwise. So that also helps foster greater acceptance of those children um, back home. I saw from the chat somebody asked something about the new challenges uh, relating to counterterrorism. So when we having, for example, children that are radicalized from their association with them, um, terrorists, sorry for the use of that word, um, groups, we are trying to find ways to go about them and probably having some specific programs tailoring those children, but those are some of the new challenges we have to deal um, with. So I don't know if I have um, answered the question or oh, Adrian. Thank you, Solange. Um, and Janine, um, uh, any points you'd like to add from community? Yeah, uh, maybe just a quick two minutes of realizing that we um, <clears throat> are, are, are going to be running out of time soon. But um, one of the things that I would add is, you know, sometimes the negotiations happen very fast and there's suddenly a need to accommodate a number of children that have been released um, in a context that might not formally have reintegration programs in place. Um, and um, in those cases, um, UN and other actors have tried to leverage as best as possible whatever child protection systems are available. What facilities can you house these children in? 
what staff can you mobilize from UNICEF and other organizations to do in, as soon as possible training of uh, local social workers and others uh, so that they're in a best position to help to provide um, some of the reintegration programming. Um, I do think it is a mor moral and ethical responsibility to ensure that when handover protocols are being negotiated, there are structures in place to well sort of receive the children to make sure that they can be safely reintegrated back into those communities and that those structures are being developed um, simultaneously with the handover protocol negotiations. But I would say in the immediate short term, and this is discussed a little bit in the guidance note, uh, people have really tried to leverage as much as possible pre-existing services that are in place. Um, but yeah, this is really a negotiation you should take on when, um, it, when it is apparent that there will be uh, proper reintegration services available for children. Thank you. Um, and um, I know we're soon nearing an end, so I'll maybe um, try to uh, do a, a quick flash round of a, of a few outstanding questions. Um, I know Solange uh, did touch on the issue of uh, the counterterrorism legislation and um, challenges that that poses, um, but uh, I wanted to also maybe ask if Janine uh, could further elaborate on that from some of the other contexts that, that you'd looked at. Um, and then lastly, um, if uh, both colleagues can touch on uh, provisions for uh, girls um, specifically. Uh, I know Janine mentioned this in her presentation and it's a key um, section of the operational guidance. Or should I go ahead and start? <laughs> sure, yes. Sure. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, I think in some countries, um, counterterrorism legislation really has been a challenge uh, for navigating and figuring out how handover protocols are even going to be approached or discussed, if at all. Um, and I think the lessons learned uh, from these, these contexts, um, especially where they haven't really been able to initiate the handover protocol negotiations, I would say there are two things. First of all, these discussions uh, are not in vain. Um, often, when children are detained under counterterrorism laws, you will find it's rare that all of the children actually meet the criteria under the counterterrorism law to be there. Many children are below the age of criminal responsibility or have been detained because they have family ties or have been detained because they have their religious or ethnic identities or because they've been found in areas that are uh, where armed groups or armed forces are known to operate. The population of children typically in some of those places extends beyond children that have been directly involved in um, an armed group or force. And there's a lot that can be done to chip away at that population and really ensure um, that the only children that are actually in uh, or are, that are being held by the government are children that have actually actively participated in um, in armed group or force and have participated in criminal activity. Um, so in those contexts, um, one of the approaches that uh, UN and other actors have started to do is, this is a very challenging, we're up against some very tough counterterrorism laws, let actually look at the population of children, it's heterogeneous, there tend to be lots of different children there, and see how we can slowly start to break away at that population, and handover protocols can be used to address that. The second thing is handover protocols are very good awareness raising tools. There are a lot of government representatives that do, are not um, you know, necessarily well informed about protections for children. And uh, counterterrorism laws are not designed with child protection um, protections in mind. A lot of them don't even have specific distinctions by age. And the handover protocol negotiation can be an important awareness raising incentive uh, to highlight or show, show shortcomings in the law um, and how um, they need to be better provisions and protections for children. Uh, so that's the one thing I would say about that. Um, they are challenging, it is, it is a difficult negotiation, but still worth having. And the second thing is, yeah, in, in the handover protocol, we did try to include, even though it doesn't exist in other contexts, some specific recommendations to make sure that girls are included in handovers. As we know, um, they're often overlooked because they typically don't serve in combatant roles and so are not necessarily seen as, as victims or, 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 in, or as people in needing of assistance. And um, we basically sort of come up with three recommendations, which is first that uh, people from the military, um, as well as women from uh, female detention facilities, uh, need to be trained to help identify uh, girls who are associated with armed forces and armed groups. Those girls need to be informed um, of the reintegration services that are, uh, are available to them and be put in a position where they can uh, be given an informed, uh, where they can make an informed choice about participating. 
And uh, the third thing is reintegration programs really need to be designed with them in mind. So to have things like uh, provisions for their children, for example, um, we know that girls perhaps perform better in community-based reintegration programs and not necessarily in residential community-based programs. So designing the reintegration programming with them in mind to encourage their handover. Sorry, back to you, Solange. And just if you have any points to add regarding um, yes, I uh, was, reintegration yes. support for girls. Yeah, just to mention that, I think I also mentioned that we make sure that all the centers that are basically supposed to receive girls are first having the minimum required, you know, that girls are being separated from boys and that they're, they're having to cater for their minimum needs. I would just take an example that is very obvious. If for example, they're having their periods or any type of girl specific needs that also, you know, factored and catered for. And I was talking about sexual violence and how we not only have ready-made programs, but also people on standby ready to provide support. So without, uh, you know, monopolizing the world, that's just what I wanted to mention, that it first starts from our CTOs when we make sure that we take care of them before proceeding, of course, to the specific reintegration. Uh, Janine just mentioned something very specific, how girls can be very good at certain programs. So we also make sure that whatever programming, especially in Mali, trust me, you have many reintegration um, projects that are just for girls and definitely not for boys, as you can imagine. <laughs> Thank you. Great, thank you, Solange. Um, well, we're um, we're just uh, just past uh, 10 a.m. here in New York, uh, and uh, thank you, colleagues, for uh, for joining us today uh, from all, all over the world uh, and um, uh, quite late in some of your time zones. Um, we really um, appreciate the the interest um, and are sorry that we can't get to all the questions. Uh, but uh, Janine's shared her email in the chat. We've also sh shared watch lists, uh, general email box, which is uh, regularly monitored. Uh, we welcome any feedback on the guidance, um, especially interested to hear uh, if any of the colleagues um, use these uh, these tips towards your your work um, and how the guidance can be further improved or uh, updated in the future. Um, and we hope to continue the discussion with, with, um, with many of you. So, um, well, thank you once again to um, Janine and Solange, um, our presenters, uh, for your very insightful um, presentations today and your thoughtful responses to the, the questions. Um, and uh, and the, once again, thank you to our colleagues uh, for the Alliance uh, for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action uh, and its CAFAG Task Force. Uh, as well as my fellow colleagues at Watchlist uh, for helping to support the development uh, and launch of this operational guidance. Um, well, um, and with that, um, thank you all and uh, have a very nice rest of the day. <laughs>